and welcome to The Bottom Line, where we get into the main business and economic stories of the day. On the back of today's release of the competitiveness report authored by former European Central Bank President Mario Draghi, we want to get into the most pressing changes the EU needs to make. To discuss this, I am now joined by Magdalena Polan, Head of Emerging Market Macroeconomic Research at PGIM. Good afternoon and thank you very much for joining me. Good afternoon. So to begin with, I wanted to get into this long-awaited report released with some delay, as we all know. But for the uh, purpose of our viewers, I just wanted to ask you, what is the purpose of this competitiveness report? What is it? Let's look at the big picture here. Um, we are, Europe is facing a question, as always, which direction we are heading and what environment we face as we chart this new direction. And we can see that the conflict in Ukraine, the increase in energy prices that the European producers and consumers pay, also the rise of China and other powers, has raised this question, can we still, as Europe, be a competitive, viable economic power in this new world? And I guess that's the, really the questions that they try to answer and the ideas that would really push Europe ahead. And Mario Draghi has also called with significant urgency, I want to emphasize, that the EU has to fund radical and rapid reform to stop the union falling behind the US and China. And to the layman, that actually sounds very serious. What happens if the EU doesn't make this happen? So let's look back um, a few steps. One thing is the rise of China and very strong investment in a number of technologies. If you remember from the past, China invested a lot into textile industries. Then it was the shipping industry and then electronics. Now it's all about the green transition, the green energy, electric cars, and a number of high tech industries. Then in the US, US stepped back from its uh, reluctance to engage into the economy and with the CHIPS Act, with the inflation Reduction Act, US actually went for more industrial policy. It's also benefiting from lower energy prices. And that makes really the EU leaders ask, like, are we going to stay in place? And as all these other regions grow, will we, in comparison to them, shrink as a relative power? And will we then be dependent on the technologies they develop? But is the EU perhaps already dependent? Well, we are all dependent on each other. The world is so interconnected that we have to stay dependent. We talk quite often on other shows about the trade war and U.S. trying to cut its reliance on China and China trying to cut its reliance on the U.S. But it's very different than in the past during the Cold War when the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc and the Western Bloc were quite separated. In the modern economy, we are so much more uh, dependent, but still technologies do matter, energy effectiveness matter, relative incomes of regions do matter. And I think as Europe is now trying to chart this path in also more uncertain geopolitical environment, it needs to know whether its economic foundations are strong enough and it can also have a stronger hand through stronger economy to deal in that new geopolitical environment. And moving on, uh, about the report so far and what we know about it so far, because it's very long, as we all know, what would you consider to be the absolute top competitiveness priority for Europe right now? I would say it's not really a specific issue. I think we know what their issues are. I think the key issue is really to actually act is to act, it's to agree on policies. Of course, EU is a very unique economic and political environment. It's an association of states where we have the commission, the parliament, the council, but also all the member states that have their own policies. And that can lead to the so-called fudges, slow solutions, and solutions that then get pulled apart by different uh, national governments. So I think they're really the most uh, urgent recommendation there is really be urgent and act, and also start to invest more become less dependent on only state investment, but allow private sector to, uh, to uh, invest, and also actually make sure that the integration really happens. So, for example, the limits on competitiveness, anti-competitiveness measure, uh, integration, mergers, more encouragement for investments, I think all these would be really some of the key and probably implementable changes. In but in terms of, uh, as we know, that there are issues with economic growth and obviously there are areas of 
of energy, defense, etc. I'm sure there is one area that you perhaps feel, based on your professional work, that you feel strongly about that the EU should, should address. I would say it's to actually act. act. It's to act to uh, see the, the situation and uh, maybe even just push the reforms that have been already enacted in terms of the um, free market, freedom of movement, and allowing for a little bit more of that common European instruments as well, so common European policies in various areas. Of course, it's mean giving up some more of your sovereignty, but if we are to act as a bloc, we cannot do it as disjointed there's jointed powers, we have to really do it as an EU and agree on some of that sharing. One of the issues that was highlighted uh, in the report is that the EU has, that Europe has struggled with slowing economic growth for some time now. Uh, my question to you is, why has this issue only been addressed now if the problem has been around for quite some time? Well, I think it's becoming more apparent as US especially is enjoying very strong growth despite multiple geopolitical shocks, but also despite a spike in inflation and a spike in interest rates. Despite that, the US economy has almost defied the odds. And we've been waiting for signs of recessions in the US already last summer. They have never materialized. A labor market is very strong. Um, energy prices remain much lower in the US. And I think as this US exceptionalist continues, the difference between the EU and the US becomes more apparent and the urgency to act and simply the numbers that are visible in the economic data become even more apparent. Of course, the energy shock related to uh, Russian invasion in Ukraine and the spike uh, that affected especially industry also in Germany um, might have been a temporary effect. But we are now more than two, two and a half years into the conflict, and of course the effects are not temporary. So um, that's probably also pushing policymakers to rethink the strategy. And moving on, uh, still on economic growth, but looking at tech, for instance, we see that Europe is not a technological strength. Uh, and only four of the top 50 tech companies are European, so the figures are very, very low. How does Europe have to overcome this hurdle given the challenges that we face? Well, we can look at what's the driver of success of the other tech companies, and they usually come either from the US, but also from Asia, from China. We have a number of very strong tech companies in Europe, but quite often it's the availability of funding, risk-taking, and I think the report calls for more risk-taking, a little bit more of that animal spirit uh, in the entrepreneurial group. Uh, but it's also investments, it's support of the state, it's not that these tech giants were built without support of the state. They actually have received it. They obviously receive it in China as well. So, if, And also the scale of the country. Again, having more of a freedom of proper economic integration within the EU probably could help creating that scale also of the capital market in Europe. Just going back to that 800 billion euro mm -hmm. figure that Draghi mentioned uh, as an absolute necessity, uh, for uh, EU competition reform. Uh, there's always a price to pay when you invest that amount of money. Uh, but is it really about the money or is it really about making some changes, perhaps a more united front? Uh, what is your take on that? What was your reaction when you saw that figure? I think as an economist, I tend to think much more about fundamentals and conditions for doing business rather than just the pure numbers. Um, the number in terms of the overall scale of the EU economy is not massive. Let's say, depends how you count it, let's say it would be 4% of the European GDP. It's more about the conditions in which uh, the incentives, uh, the, the freedom of movement, the freedom of, of trade, that creates conditions that, that help. And also then also the predictability of the environment in which companies and also agencies operate. If they know the support is there, if they know that the regulations are there, they are not going to change, that they can operate on a larger scale across many countries, that creates conditions that are more um, suitable for the development of tech companies. In US, these companies operate in a very large single market with access to the largest capital market in the world. In China, these companies receive a large state and know that there is a policy commitment to developing technological independence. So maybe some of that would also be helpful in, in Europe. 
And just one final question very briefly. This report comes as a, at a time when discussions are brewing when it comes to the next seven-year EU budget. And obviously, emotions will run quite high when it comes to that. Do you think that those budgetary discussions can somehow fall in line or be combined, uh, addressed together with uh, the challenges that have been uh, brought up with this competitiveness budget? Of course, that can be done. And also national level, also here in Warsaw, when uh, governments set their budgets, they have a budget as on cash basis, but also the budget with their goals. And individual spending items and policies should then help meet those goals. So yes, having this guiding principle, uh, as you decide on the budget, would be helpful and would be one of the many necessary steps to get there. Okay, Magdalena Polan, thank you so much for joining me in the studio thank today. You. Thank you. And that was Magdalena Polan, Head of Emerging Market e Macroeconomic Research at PGIM, joining us today in the studio. Thank you so much for joining us on The Bottom Line. I was your host, Marie Cato. Join us again tomorrow at 5 p.m. CET on TVP World. For more business stories, check us out on X and on tvpworld.com. Coming up next, World Talks. Goodbye. <laughs>